Well, thank you so much. It is wonderful to see you all here for the fourth installment of the Race and Revolution Lecture Series, founded by me and Roger Berkowitz. Um, tonight's speakers are an exciting bunch. We have Kirk A. Johnson, who is the author of African American Tea Party Supporters, Explaining a Political Paradox. He, explained, he teaches sociology and African American studies at the University of Mississippi, where he studies race and news media. His interest in politics and race dates back to his work at the Center for Science and the Public Interest, where he testified before congressional committees on protecting at-risk populations from toxic pollutants, and as senior researcher on the Emmy Award-winning PBS documentary, Eyes on the Prize, America's Civil Rights Years, from 1965 to 1980. He's also founding editor of the Journal of Healthcare for the Poor and Undeserved, published by Johns Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University Press. Um, he also worked with our next guest, Marie Strader, on his book, African American Tea Party Supporters. Now, Marie Strader is a Christian wife, homeschooling mother, pro-life advocate, seasoned social media and digital campaign strategist, co-founder of African American Conservatives, ACONS, um, digital communications director for the Republican Party of Texas, and an advisory board member for Black Voices for Trump. The opinions expressed here tonight are her own. And the Hannah Arendt Center is very excited to have you all here for this conversation. Um, Roger, can I leave it to you? Great. Thank you, Sky. And I really appreciate Sky's work in uh, helping to really conceive and, and get this lecture series off the ground, which I think has been off to a wonderful start. And I look forward to our, our discussion tonight. Um, I am Roger Bergwitz, and I am the founder and academic director at the Arendt Center here at Bard College. Um, our, uh, the, the, the talk tonight um, is with two people, and, and Sky just introduced them to you. I'll just I'll mention that um, I think it was uh, two summers ago, I, I got an email from a press um, asking me to review a manuscript called African American Tea Party Supporters. Um, and I was surprised it's not the, the normal kind of book uh, I get asked to review as an Arendt scholar. Um, but I was interested in it. It, it. You know, one, one. I guess there was a kind of African-American Tea Party, Party supporters, really. Um, so I wanted to read it, uh, and I did. And I thought it was incredibly illuminating, uh, brave, and... Um, and, uh, and, and and really thought provoking. It, it 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 made me. It challenged me and pushed me. And uh, and that's why uh, Kirk Kirk and Marie are here tonight. That Kirk wrote the book. Marie, I take it was a, a major source for the book. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. and you know this lecture series on race and revolution. You know again, for those of you who've been here a couple times, know this, but. We are trying to say, look, a lot of us know what the problem is, right? We don't want racial discrimination. We don't want racism. We want to get rid of the problem. We know what the problem is, but what's the solution? Where do we go? What's, what are we fighting for? Not just what are we fighting against? And, um, and I think it's important in articulating what we are fighting for uh, to uh, bring in to the conversation people throughout the political uh, spectrum and uh, people who we have to agree with. I mean, we don't have to agree with on everything, but we at least have to uh, come to some sort of meeting of the minds with. And so um, the Race and Revolution series is an attempt to do that. We've had already a wide range of, of people uh, uh, that we've been talking to. And, and today we, we continue that, uh, that tradition. So uh, I'm very excited to have Kirk Johnson and Marie Strutter here. So I thought I'd start by um, letting them each say a little bit about themselves and what they do. But for Kirk, maybe first, um, why he wrote the book and, 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 and what he learned in writing the book. And, and then the next question I'll ask is sort of, you know, what can we learn from him and from this book? So why don't we start with Kirk and... Uh, and, we'll, and then we'll have Marie speak a little bit and then we'll have a conversation. That sounds great. Thank you, Roger. Uh, and I want to just start by expressing my appreciation uh, to Roger for inviting us here. Uh, and also thanks to both him and uh, Marie for their assistance in pulling together this uh, book project. I mean, anybody who has 
uh, worked on big projects know that they are collaborative in nature. One person can't do everything. Roger was kind enough, as he mentioned, to look at the manuscript and contribute a blurb. Uh, and Marie was helpful because uh, not only did she very kindly consent to being interviewed for it herself, but she did lead me to about 10 or 12 other people who were very gracious in letting me talk with them and bend their ear and ask them questions about their party affiliation and their politics and their background, their history, their, their families. Um, and that was immensely helpful. So I'm very grateful for her as well. Uh, but to get to Roger's question, you know, what prompted my interest in this topic? Um, I, it was a really simple observation. And you know, sometimes really interesting academic projects arise from very simple observations that just kind of get inside of your soul and won't let you go. Um, after President Obama was inaugurated, a few months later, many of us remember the news footage of these crowds of protesters that grew to um, express their discontent meant with what the Obama administration uh, was doing and what it stood for. And I was so surprised as I was watching um, the network news footage of these protests, every once in a while I would see a brown face. And the context here was surprising in two ways. Number one, I, I didn't understand that there were a sizable number of brown people who weren't celebrating the Obama presidency, number, number one. And number two, um, at about the same time that this protest movement arrived, there were what I took to be unmistakable signs of, uh, of racism in the crowds. People um, with demeaning uh, uh, stereotypical images of President Obama with a bone through his nose, showing him as a witch doctor, or representations of the first family as apes, or Confederate flags in the crowd. And as an African American, I took offense to that, and I thought to myself, how could other brown people feel comfortable in that kind of environment? So I began to make some phone calls around and try to locate as many uh, supporters of the Tea Party who were African American that I could found, find. And I was so surprised. My presumption was that African Americans supported this insurgent movement for maybe one of three reasons. It's possible, I figured, that they might have mixed feelings about being African American. And, and if so, that might explain their ambivalence about supporting the president. A second possibility was that they didn't think that racism was really a thing. You know, if you downplay the role of racism in your life as a black person, you might see no need to address racial grievances uh, or race, race related policies, fair housing policies, uh, fair employment policies, um, uh, criminal justice reform, et cetera. Or you might also disregard what I thought were unmistakable signs of, signs of racial animosity at these rallies. So that was another possibility. And the third was that you might have just been socialized by your parents or grandparents to be self-reliant, hard workers. You came up thinking, I can pull my own weight. I don't need government assistance to succeed in this world. You might also think you know, a, a corollary, which is that poor people are lazy, that government entitlements are not just unnecessary, but they are counterproductive. You know, they don't build self-sufficiency. Um, and what I've, I mean, so those to me were just kind of common sense, uh, back of the envelope reasons for why this movement might include some African Americans. What I found though, was that all three of them were problematic. That these were people who didn't have mixed feelings about being black at all. They felt fantastic about being black. They might differ from other African Americans uh, only in the means to arrive at the same ends, which is a better life for people of color and black people in general. Um, some of them did downplay racism. One person told me that institutional racism just doesn't exist. I mean, he flat out said that. As a sociologist, that's not what I was trained to believe, but he certainly did. And yet there are many other people who spoke very sociologically about the fact that yes, racism isn't just a thing, but it's also woven into the very fabric of so many of our legal institutions, our educational institutions, our financial institutions. And that was a surprise to me. And I also found that even though, yes, many of these sympathizers, just like many African Americans generally, were socialized to be hard working, self reliant adults uh, as children, that about a third of them also believed very strongly that poverty is not just an individual phenomenon, but it's very much a systemic problem that's rooted in, uh, in many of our major institutions. 
So one of the lessons I picked up from this is that how unfair it is to act on presumptions about who groups of people are, as opposed to investigating who they are uh, and figuring out for yourself, making observations based on your own empirical evidence. Uh, my assumption about many of these people was a lot like a lot of African-American critics who look down on Tea Party supporters and just think of them as self-loathing race traders. You know, uh, people who are the modern day equivalent of you know, the old fashioned Sambo uh, images, carrying water for the man. And I just don't think that's at all true. These are people who feel fantastic about being black. They really want the best things for uh, African-Americans and other people of color. But again, they, they differ in their conviction of how to get there. Um, so the, the thing that unites them is the fact that they all believe in the fact that government doesn't have to be so big. We don't have to spend so big. Our taxes don't need to be uh, so high. We need to develop self-sufficiency and a, a, an ethic that embodies hard work. We need to believe in ourselves. As one fellow I talked to said, I said, you know, what do you do if you grow up in a poor family, you're in an African-American ghetto, everything you see around you spells failure for you for the future. What do you do? You have all these forces set against you. And he said, you got to achieve anyway. And that's all he said. You know, despite all these forces that are set on limiting your life chances, if you believe in yourself and push hard, you can achieve anyway. So in, in the diversity in this population, those are some truisms that I found throughout this community of very interesting, fascinating people I was able to talk to. Well, thank you very much, Kirk. Um, before we go further on that, maybe I'll let Marie say a little bit about her background and, and, and how she ended up becoming one of the, um, I don't know if the African-American Tea Party supporters that Kirk was writing about. Oh, you got to unmute. You have to unmute, Marie. First, I want to thank you, Roger, for inviting me and Sky for putting this together and Kirk for uh, including me in your book. Um, I grew up in San Francisco in the late 1960s, early 1970s. And in my predominantly black neighborhood, uh, every business that I encountered was black owned. We had newspapers, we had pharmacies, um, thriving economic environment. And so it was the model that I grew up with, that we were a very strong, vibrant community with our own economic resources. Um, and I saw that decimated really um, in the middle uh, of the 1970s when um, government came in and there was some redevelopment and we were pushed back several blocks um, from the neighborhood that I grew up in and kind of the economy sort of collapsed for us. And that was a very strong model for me growing up. That was a very strong um, marker that I just kind of took note of. And that was kind of what I pinned everything against or compared everything against. So fast forward um, a few years um, in college, I became a Christian. And in my reading of scripture and my understanding of scripture, um, and, and I should mark before that, that I was staunchly pro-life, even as a uh, registered Democrat um, and uh, someone who had very liberal leanings um, and growing up in a very liberal household, I was always pro-life. Um, but as I uh, read the scriptures and, and became um, more comfortable in my own skin, um, separate from my family's identity, um, I really realized that there were a lot of things that align, that did not align with where I was politically, and I began to shift. And I noticed that shift um, as I became more spiritually aware as well as politically aware. Then fast forward to when we uh, elected Barack Obama as our first African-American president. And I will say that that was um, a moment for me as far as historicity goes. Um, I was enormously proud of that achievement, even though I disagreed policy-wise with very much of what President Obama's administration stood for. 
Um, and it was that sort of atmosphere that led me to co-found African-American conservatives because what I found on social media is that so many people were coming up to me congratulating me on my president. And I'm thinking, well, he's president of the United States. He's kind of everybody's president, you know. So the implication was because of my skin color, um, it must be that I shared in the policies of this administration and that nothing could be further from the truth. So I went on a quest similar to Professor Johnson in finding out, well, why would people make that assumption that, you know, are, are we really that monolithic in our thinking? Um, is there no room for diversity of thought in this group that I belong to culturally? Um, and so that quest has led me through a number of presidential campaigns that I have served on. Um, it's led me to uh, now be appointed to the advisory board for Black Voices for Trump. And um, still, I, as Professor Johnson alluded to, I am quite comfortable in my skin. I'm quite comfortable in my identity. And I do believe that, and very strongly believe um, in a number of issues, um, but they are just from a different perspective in how to arrive at a solution. A as Roger said, I don't think anyone disagrees about what the problems are or what the issues are. Um, I think it really is how do we come together as a consensus and where are uh, the solutions? And so that's what I, I'm, I'm so thankful to be here today and to be a part of this discussion. And I really wanna thank you for including me. Thank you, Marie, and th thanks both. So my first question, is going to sort of try and bring us from the book into this lecture series, which is, um, do we need a revolution, right, in race relations in this country? I mean, uh, Marie, you've been part of a Tea Party movement, if, if that's correct, right, which at least for some people is a revolutionary movement. I don't know if you see it as a revolutionary movement. I'd love your thoughts on that. Um, uh, many people have begun to see the last seven years of the Black Lives Matter movement as a second civil rights movement, um, a second civil rights revolution. And so um, I, I guess two questions for both of you. Uh, and one is, um, you know, Marie, you said we all agree on the problem. And, and, and I wonder, do you agree that we need a revolution to address racial inequality in this country right now? That's a question for both of you. And, and, and secondly, um, uh, is the time ripe for that kind of a revolution as some people in uh, looking at the success uh, of the Black Lives Matter or the partial success of the Black Lives Matter movement uh, have suggested? So that's a, a question for both Kirk and Marie. Um, maybe Marie, I'll ask you to go first. I mean, do you think uh, we need a revolution in race relations in this country? I know that many of the things that are important in this country uh, were born out of revolution. However, I think that looking at the current panorama that we're in, and I had, I've had a number of discussions um, with family and friends about this very specific thing. My concern is if you look at the way that things are playing out right now. On, now, see, so you have to realize that we have media following everything that we do. Social media is at your fingertips, and that's different than we've had at any other period in time when revolution has occurred, right? So that's a difference. And I think that to see what we're seeing on television, where cities are ablaze and people are, um, smashing things and breaking things. And these are in predominantly black neighborhoods where black capital and black sweat, sweat equity have built up these institutions. It's very hard for me to see that happen. And so what I've, I've posited is that, okay, I understand that there's anger and I get that. And I, I would not say that that's not justifiable anger. However, 
the way that we are, and again, remember what I said, I grew up in the 60s and 70s where I was surrounded by black owned businesses and that's kind of the lens through which I see the world. Um, and so I see these black owned businesses that are being destroyed and I see these neighborhoods that are being decimated. Where are people shopping? Where are people cashing checks? Where are teenage workers going um, to, to have jobs? And those kinds of things when you see Starbucks being smashed. Yeah, okay, maybe it's the man, but there are black workers that work there. So, so when I see these kinds of things, I, I had a conversation with my cousin who said, well, don't you worry about your black sons? I have two black sons. And I said, well, of course I worry about my black sons. But here's the thing. Do you really think that night after night after night, let's talk about Ferguson. What was it, 10 nights? Um, and then maybe in the aftermath of George Floyd, it was weeks of television where everything is ablaze and we see all of the looting and the rioting and, and people carrying off plasma TVs and those sorts of things. Does that really make it safer for my sons? Are the permit patties watching that going to now, who've been clutching their purses when my sons come by, now going to say, oh, well, this is a righteous movement. I'm no longer, I've been so wrong at how I've seen the world. I'm not going to do that anymore. I think that they're has to be another way so can to... I can I ask Marie is, is your is your is your is your worry about the movement for black lives one simply of means but you share the goals or is it a different I mean I'm just trying to understand because you've been right. talking about means um, I, I think understand part you don't of it like means. the means part but of it I... is means and part of it is goals I believe that every Black life matters from the womb to the grave, and I will die on that hill. However, the organization Black Lives Matter, I feel, is a separate entity. They have scrubbed their website recently, but previously to that, they had language that said, we disrupt the nuclear family. If you believe that part of the systemic issue in the black community is fatherlessness, that's problematic for me. I believe that the nuclear family is crucial. Um, prior to the late 1960s, we had a 77% rate of two parent black households prior to the great society. So I feel that um, now the statistic is, and I think it's from maybe 19, I'm sorry, 2015, but it's something like 17% of African American children reach the age of 17 with both parents in the home. That's problematic to me. So I, and I guess the other issue that I have is that $464 million have been raised um, and yet what is being done with that money other than being funneled to candidates um, with whom I disagree uh, and, and that's fine. But I guess I, I expected that we would see uh, scholarships for people to enter the system to create change from within the system, to create scholarships for people to become judges, paralegals, correctional officers, uh, those sorts of things, so that we could make the change from the inside out, as we have always done. And so that's been surprising to me. So it is methodology as well as uh, the means. Uh, Kirk Johnson, you want to um, jump in and you know speak a little bit about your thoughts on on Black Lives Matter uh, as a revolutionary moment or the civil rights movement that moment that we're in. And if you'd like to compare it to the Tea Party or the African American Tea Party movement, that would be great. Uh, however you wanna engage that. Yeah, I think it's a great question. Uh, I think that you can look at revolutions in lots of ways. I think the Tea Party movement qualifies as a revolution to the extent that it really shook up the status quo and, and threatened to kind of um, overturn business as as usual, as people came to think of it in Washington. I think Black Lives Matter is doing that too. I mean, I, I, to me, it, implicit in your question, Roger, is revolution something that we need? Yeah, we do. Uh, to the extent that it helps people think differently about how we achieve the goals, as you say, that everybody wants to head toward. 
Um, the question really makes me think about some work by, really great work by a sociologist at uh, UC Santa Barbara by the name of Howard Wynant, uh, who, uh, and you may be familiar with it, who with the co-author uh, Michael Omi, also a sociologist, wrote a book called The World is a Ghetto. And what they've done is they've kind of sketched how historically the connections between slavery and colonialism and capitalism and imperialism have kind of functioned to serve the ends of what they call racial projects for hundreds of years that have ensured the, the dominance of white folks and the subordination of poor people and people of color. These are going on on every continent that they have for a long time. And I don't see any um, sign that they're going to diminish or the power of the combined effect of these racial projects is going to end. It would be great if it did, that would constitute a, a revolution. Um, but I don't think that's really necessary for us to have meaningful change um, in this country. I agree with Marie. I, I don't think that we want to see destruction of property and people's livelihoods and certainly the loss of life um, that you know, we, we see periodically that accompany some revolutionary moments. There have been, there's been some of that recently. But you don't have to have that kind of a revolution either to change how people think. I think the, the publicity around George Floyd has done tremendous uh, amounts. Just the, 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 the news footage of what happened to him um, has galvanized public opinion in ways that unfortunately publicity surrounding other uh, African-Americans who've died at the hands of police haven't. Um, the Washington Post recently did um, a summary of the last five years of police deaths, police killings, and they found that about a thousand people a year die at the hands of the police. Um, some of them armed, some of them not, but disproportionate numbers of them African Americans. And I think that kind of publicity has been enough to galvanize public opinion so that now, you know, according to the Pew Research people, uh, many, many more white Americans are on board with where African Americans have been for years in understanding that racism is a real problem that we have to deal with. So if you, if you define revolution as changing how people think, uh, yes, it is important, it is necessary for lasting change, but it's also something that's, that's already going on. If I could add to that, I would say also um, personal revolution. You know, one of the things that I have done in, in the bio that Sky was kind enough to read, um, I mentioned that I'm a homeschooling mother. And that was a revolutionary act because I have to say that um, in the 15, 20 years that I've been homeschooling, I've seen a handful of black families. Um, and one of the reasons that we chose to homeschool, not just for religious reasons, but because institutions get our history wrong. They get our history wrong and they get it wrong repeatedly. And I wanted to be in control of the narrative regarding what my children learned. Um, and that is not uncommon in our community throughout time. And so I think that there are individual acts that we can take as well um, that constitute revolution. I, I'm wondering, you know, you, 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 Marie, talked earlier about um, the plurality of, the, of, of an African-American community, that it's not all homogenous or, or one-sided. And, and something Kirk said earlier, um, I think he said it, and I'm not just making it up from reading his book, um, but he said that when he first saw the Tea Party, um, you know, he, he was upset by the, what he thought to be racist elements of, of it. And, and I certainly know that many uh, of my students, and I think many myself, feel that way also about parts of the Trump administration. I'm, I'm wondering to what extent that matters in your, in, your, in your approach to these questions. Is that just like something we accept and move on? Or, or do you disagree with that as a characterization? Part of it goes with the territory. I cannot think 
and I'm, and I'll freely admit I'm 56 years old, uh, and I've been uh, alive during a number of presidential administrations, and I cannot think of one where there weren't cartoons or um, some sort of something where they are caricatures of different things about them. It's part of what happens when you are in the public eye. People will talk about you and people will say things about you and people will mischaracterize you. It is part of being part of the public arena. As Kirk mentioned, um, there were pictures of President Obama with a bone in his nose and people uh, with effigies and those sorts of things and people talking about our first lady's appearance um, beautiful first lady, um, likening her to an ape and those sorts of things. And I condemned those things. However, I also see orange man bad. I see things of him as a fat baby and over London, you know, there are, uh, cartoons and there are big balloons. Um, and so I, I think that that is par for the course when, when someone is in pol the political arena. Um, they did effigies of George Bush. So, um, do I see that this administration is more racist than other administrations. I do not. Um, and I have to say, I have met President Trump. I have been in the room with President Trump. I have observed him in a number of venues. I've observed his family. I've observed how his family interacts with people who have my skin color. Um, and, and that doesn't lie. Um, you can fake it pretty good for a little while, but when your family is around, um, I think you kind of pick up clues about um, unconscious bias, you know, or conscious bias. You see that in the way that people are acting with each other. And I've never seen that. Um, yes, people talk about his America first policies. Um, the way that I interpret that is that, um, for example, with illegal immigration, that some of the jobs that are taken away are jobs that low skilled or blue, blue collar black workers would have. And so to me, that is protecting my community and the jobs in my community. Um, and people might see that differently. People will say, well, that's xenophobic, that's this or that's whatever. And you may see that in that way. But as Professor Johnson said in the book, that for every policy that you might be able to criticize someone who supports a conservative ideal, um, there is probably a nuanced reason for that support. For example, life. Um, 20 million babies have been aborted since Roe v. Wade. Um, in fact, I read a statistic that said that that it is more than the pop black population of uh, 1960. So I think that, that there are some real reasons why people might have some issues. Um, and so it's really coming to a consensus about what are some practical solutions to, um, if we're gonna say that Black Lives Matter, Black Lives in the womb don't matter. So I think that, that we have to have some consistency in our approach. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions on some of these issues, but before we do that, Kirk, Professor Johnson, you, know, you spent a couple of years talking to, as you call them, African-American Tea Party supporters. To what extent do you feel like um, there's an there's a unbridgeable gulf, and to what extent do you feel like um, I mean, is it should we should we be talking about the African American community? Are there different communities? Um, and 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 are we all part of the same conversation? I'm just wondering how you now see these questions. I think those are great questions. I I um, I think the thing that I learned is that. Uh, it's very important to respect the possibility, as Marie has just said, that people may have arrived at who they are, who they've become, what they think, what they believe in, that may seem alien and even irrational to outsiders who don't know them, but may seem perfectly rational to people who investigate their lives. And Marie is a kind of a walking example of that. I mean, she's not someone who supported um, Obamacare by any means. And when I asked her why, um, she told a story of how her uh, her mom, um, uh, who was a late stage cancer victim, um, had to be subjected to a public uh, care in a public hospital. That was terrible. Uh, and it was, I, I think it was so traumatic for her as a daughter that she began to think, hey, listen, this is not an experiment that we need to enlarge 
I think the, I mean, one of the themes of the book is that the more you delve into people's family history, their experiences, the more their political perspectives seem uh, understandable and not just understandable, but also sensible. I mean, I might not agree with uh, everything that a Tea Party supporter does, but that's not to say that if I hadn't grown up in their shoes, I wouldn't be in their position not agreeing with someone like me. So that I think is one way to kind of bridge this gulf that separates people and, and that may make us pay more attention to how we imagine people are than how they actually are. Is that helpful, Roger? It is. Um, I'm just, I mean, I'm just, I'm just wondering, you know, I think, I think for many people uh, uh, on this, on this call, and, and I'll just be honest, I think most people on this call are, are probably not Tea Party supporters. Um, you know, uh, I think there's an, a, there's an inclination to see this as a, you know, you said you originally had seen it as, oh, they must be uncomfortable with their skin or race. Um, and I think you've done a very good job. And I think Maria has made it very clear that that's not the issue. And I think there's a discomfort still. And I'm wondering if you feel that discomfort or if you don't, have you sort of gotten past that? Um, or do you understand the question? Is there a discomfort with um, uh, the very idea? I mean, I, I think when you started the book, you had a discomfort with the idea of African-American Tea Party supporters. At least that was my understanding of what you said. Are you more comfortable with it? And is it part of the world that you see now as part of your world? I don't know if I'd go that far um, because I have other reasons for uh, advocating policies that I don't think every Tea Partier would support. But uh, I, I'm, I'm certainly past the idea of mentally joining with the vilification of African-Americans who support the Tea Party because they've been very clear as they've articulated why they believe what they believe. Yeah. Um, I had an interesting conversation uh, with a fellow who, um, uh, from Mississippi, who said that, who refers to uh, white Tea Partiers as brothers. Uh, and he said he had a, um, he approached um, an outdoor uh, bonfire with four or five um, strange uh, white men who were part of the Tea Party, and he's an African American. Uh, the only thing that he has in common with them are uh, the fact that he was at a Tea Party event. Uh, he believes in God. He believes in country. He loves the flag, and even though their life experiences have, were different than his, uh, and he would never have approached uh, four unknown white men uh, de novo, it, just in, in the course of any evening in a, alone, he understands this is Mississippi, this is potentially dangerous. The fact that they had that ideological bond in common was the most important element. And he felt safe enough to approach them, have a conversation with them, drink beer with them, uh, and have a wonderful time. So I, I do get your instinctive um, pause. And I certainly had that same feeling that was socialized inside of me at a very early age. I mean, I grew up in the South um, during the 60s and 70s uh, when, as Marie was coming up as well. And uh, my uh, sister and I were taught to, as a matter of potential life and death, to be extraordinarily careful in a situation where our skin color might put us at risk of at the least ostracism and the, at the most physical harm. So that socialization has stayed with me. I don't think it ever will, will leave. But as an adult, what I'm trying to do is move beyond that instinct and, and recognize the, the humanity in people that I might otherwise um, you know, have kind of a, a, an instantaneous um, a, aversion to and understand, hey, listen, uh, they might have the same feelings about me. And I think getting back to your original question, Roger, that's really the only way to kind of make progress. If you're trying to think about ways to bring disparate communities together to achieve a goal everybody believes in, we have to figure out ways to move beyond instinct. I think that's my sense to try to uh, recognize, okay, I may not agree with you on points A, B, and C, but I can see D, E, and F, and G, I'm really on to. Let's see if we can figure out that as a common basis for us moving forward, as opposed to being uh, feeling uh, so um, 
repelled by A, B, and C that, that we never come together. So one last question for Marie. Marie, what do you, if you said very forcefully before that you are, you die on the hill that you believe every black lives matters. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and Professor Johnson said that he, um, you know, I think rightly, in my opinion, that the Black Lives Matter movement has had some sort of revolutionary impact on, on how people um, think. I mean, I think a lot of, I mean, the, sh the polls certainly show that a wide range of people, especially white people, and even I think some African Americans, uh, have, are more aware of the struggles and the injustice facing um, Black Americans today than they were five or six years ago. Um, what do you take to be, in your mind, the most important policy or change that could improve uh, lives for Black people in the United States? I mean, you said we, we largely agree on the problem, we disagree on the way to get there. What would be the most important step in your mind towards improving race relations in the country today? One of the biggest issues um, that's important to me is school choice. As I said, I'm in my mid fifties. Um, I have lived in California my whole life. I don't think I have ever lived um, knowing that there was a Republican mayor of Oakland or uh, anything like that. And I look at our big school systems. I look at Oakland, Chicago, LA, uh, San Francisco, San Jose, all of these uh, large urban areas. And the black white achievement gap is huge. That's a problem. Um, and one of the reasons that I chose to homeschool. And I will say, you know, little pat on my back, maybe, I don't know. But my oldest uh, started college at the age of 16, dual enrolled homeschool and uh, college, uh, graduated with his Bachelor of Science degree at the age of 20. My daughter, uh, we adopted my son and my daughter, and I'll go back to adoption because I not only do I believe in life, but I have taken action with respect to life um, by adopting a, a sibling set that were older when I adopted them. Um, and my daughter was reading at the college level, late elementary, early middle school age. Um, and I do believe that that is a civil rights movement. We may be, uh, you know, segregation may have been struck down, but because under every administration since I've been alive, whether it's been uh, Republican or Democrat, uh, schools, uh, school funding is tied to property values. And so when schools that are, are in low income areas stay the same, kids that are go to school in affluent, affluent areas, those schools stay the same. Um, Jonathan Kozel's Savage Inequalities was a life changing book for me. Um, he is a liberal, he's not a conservative by any stretch of the imagination, but he got it right. Um, if you look at, um, I grew up uh, during, as I said, the late 60s, the Black Panther movement, we had our own schools, right? Why? So you have to look at some of those things. And I really believe that uh, we, schools are, are one of the big issues that I would change. Um, and are I think that we- Are you in favor of voluntarily segregated schools? I guess maybe it's it's my age. I don't know. Maybe Professor Johnson can can agree or maybe not agree. Um, I think we fought so hard to desegregate. Why would we ever go back to segregation? I was just asking because I, I I just don't think that that is the answer. See, that's what we're doing now politically. We're segregating ourselves. You're a Republican. You're a Democrat. You're a libtard. You're a, a Trumper. You know all of these labels that we put on each other. We're humans, and we all I think most of us have the best of intentions in um, raising our families with a certain set of ideals that we believe strongly in. Um, I, I, I really don't believe that segregation is the answer because as Professor Johnson said, he made a calculated risk to reach out to a group of people that did not think the way that he did. And he came away, I think, a changed person. And you hold that, to your, that tome in your hand. I came away as a, as a person whose life was changed. You know, I don't, I have a lot of friends being here in California in the Bay Area um, who are very liberal. I mean, very few people think, I, I think I got one of my closest friends in high school thinks the way that I do. Um, 
but I have never reduced someone merely to their political beliefs. Um, I see some of the comments in chat and it's like, you know, Trump supporters. And it's this blanket statement that we all, I don't think it's, it's all or nothing kind of thinking. And I think until you really get to know people on a one-to-one -one basis and really have deep conversations, and that's what I think needs to have. And that's kind of one of the criticisms I have um, of the previous administration is that, you know, everything was about race. Some things were legitimately about race, but not everything was. As I said, it's par for the course. Whoever sits in that office is going to get criticism about their policies. Um, and so it's not all about race. Uh, people can have differing ideas and to understand where I come from about life, to understand that Planned Parenthood was started by a woman who was a eugenicist, uh, who, who was a racist, who said that people like me were human weeds and undesirables. Um, that means something. And you can say that, you know, oh, well, it's evolved and it's this and that, but the, the fact of the matter is that's how it started. Um, so I think the, the, for me, it's having a conversation with someone um, that, that thinks differently and not make that set of assumptions about someone and believe that, well, you support this because you're that. Why do I support this? Ask me. I'm happy to tell you why I believe anything that I believe. And I think Kirk found that out after about four or five hours of talking to me, <laughs> that I'm not shy about sharing anything that I believe. Right. Uh, but I think it's, it's having those conversations and getting to know each other as people and not labels. And we need those labels, yeah. I think. It's, and, and that's detrimental when we start putting labels on people. Thank you. I really appreciate um, both you and Kirk uh, sharing these thoughts. We're going to open it up for questions now. Um, there's two ways to, to ask questions. One is to use the hand raise function. So if you go down to the participants button on the bottom of your screen and click on it and go next to your name and you can raise your hand um, and I can recognize you uh, or you can um, uh, put a question into um, the chat. Um, there's a question from one of my students. Megumi, Meg, do you, Megumi, do you want to uh, ask your question or do you want me to just read it? Or do you want to add to it? Um, I was just going to ask, what does being a Trump supporter mean for you or to you? Being a Trump supporter, I, I find it's interesting um, because of a lot of assumptions I think that people hold about me because of my support for this president. I will say that I started out as a never Trumper. Never, ever, ever Trumper. Uh, absolutely, 100%, not enthusiastic about this president whatsoever. Um, he had been a Democrat, he had been a Republican, he'd been an independent, he'd been everything, he'd been around the board. Um, and so I didn't really believe that he would do what he said he would do. Um, he said that he would protect life in the womb. I was like, I don't know. Uh, he, he said a lot of different things. Um, but what won me over is that he kept every single promise that was important to me. And there are a number of things. There's a, there's a document, and I can share it with all of you. I can put it into chat as soon as I'm done talking, because I can't talk and chew gum. Uh, but there's a document that talks about all of the things that he's done for the African-American community. He has given money to HBCUs. Um, and I mean, millions and millions of dollars. He's done for his facilities forgiveness for HBCUs so that they could stay open and not have to go under. Uh, there were a couple, I think, that were... Uh, having uh, taught having discussions about closing because of the facilities debt that they had um he is a proponent of school choice he is a proponent of life um he has done a number of things for the african-american community and so that has engendered my support and so for me it has been about policy i think if you look at lyndon baines johnson who was an unmitigated racist by every stretch of the imagination. Not only did he use the N-word with regularity, often with an F-bomb in front of it, but he signed civil rights into law. 
And that may have been under duress, that may have been po for political expediency, that may have been for a number of reasons. But the fact of the matter is, he wasn't a good guy and he did do it. Um, and so I don't have to be best friends with people who sit in the office. However, I do believe that this man has been mischaracterized. I will say that. I do believe that I have been in, in the room twice now where he's made a statement and I've gotten, and I'm a news hound, so I go home and say, oh, am I on TV? Let me see if I can see myself. And I go and I watch the coverage and they report something and I'm like, I was in the room, that didn't happen. He didn't say that. What are they talking about? Um, and so I think that, that there's a lot of hatred um, and that has mischaracterized a lot of what he does and what he says. He is a bombastic personality, um, but he went into the office from day one when he announced his candidacy with a 90% negative coverage uh, on, in our media. Um, that's kind of unprecedented. So I think that he is the kind of person that, you know, will fight back and talk back to his critics. Um, I think there are some people that would want to hide his phone so that he can't tweet so much. But the fact of the matter is he has the right to defend himself. We do have free speech. Um, and so I don't think you have to necessarily like the person in the office to benefit from their policies. Kirk, do you want to add anything or, or not? Um, no, actually, I, I haven't had this conversation about the president with Marie. So all of this is as new to me as it, as, as it may be to, um, to everyone here. Um, I did want to just mention something about um, the, the book, though. I think it's really important, especially for those of us in an academic community, to appreciate the importance of, of, uh, of checking political rhetoric, whether it comes from the left or the right, mm -hmm. against uh, empirical facts. And there have been, there's been so much research on poverty, on inequality, on racism. One of the reasons that I wrote this book as a scholar is that I wanted it to be more than a report about how I got to know these people. It actually is partly that, but I got to know them by interviewing them and then also fact checking the things that they were saying. So when, when you do that, what I found was that there were many statements that, uh, that the Tea Party supporters and sympathizers said that were uh, totally 100% backed up by studies uh, and factual evidence. And then there were some things that were just not. And, and so it's really important for us, I think, to be intellectually honest, no matter what perspective that we're coming from. Um, and, and through that, I think that we may be less inclined to accept specious arguments or arguments that are weak and to focus on the ones that make sense. So in my characterization of my relationships with Tea Party supporters, I didn't want to imply that, that my work is really just, uh, it starts and stops at getting to know a group of people I didn't know very much about. It also is trying to generate a thoughtful critique of the things that they're saying. Um, and, and one of the reasons I have really valued my relationship with Marie is that, you know, most of the things that she has said are, are certainly backed up by, um, by some, some facts that, that, that progressives, you know, might need to think about um, in, in order to kind of move our, our own thinking to a, a different place. And no, no political party has a, has a lock on, uh, on truth or accuracy. And if you read the fact-checking columns after uh, the last two debates, the vice presidential and the presidential debate, you know that's true. You know, there's a, a lot of truth bending that needs to be uh, corrected by, by people who are a little bit more sober-minded than just focusing on getting ahead and winning the next race. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Jacqueline, there's a question from Jacqueline Fries. Do you want to? Fries, hey, yeah, right. Um, I was going to ask like Marie, so I appreciate your point about mentioning like the political divide and like labeling. That's a very good point. I love that. But I was going to ask, um, today's Christopher Columbus Day, Indigenous People's Day, depending on your viewpoint of that. And something you mentioned was homeschooling your children because you are in Black history being accurately portrayed. However, I've noticed like Trump in several different speeches and even in his address today said, quote, he wants to promote patriotic education. For you, what does patriotic education mean? Does, and what does that include in Black history? And do you feel like, I'm not going to like say, because like not that blanket statement of supporting Trump, but do you support that patriotic education? Do you feel that will accurately cover Black history or what does that entail for you? Well, 
that's a great question, Jacqueline. I, 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 for me, um, I am a patriot as well as someone who is black. You know, um, a lot of people have been talking about our sports, right, and kneeling for the flag, and is that right and is that wrong? Um, there have been a lot of injustices in this country. I would be idiotic to try to posit anything other than that. I mean, that's an absolute fact, and as uh, Professor Johnson said, there's empirical evidence to uh, show that factually. Um, however, the flag has also done some wonderful things, right? Uh, we have the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments now. Uh, women have the right to vote. So there are a lot of things that have happened under the flag that are bad, but there are a lot of things that have happened under the flag that are good things. We've elected uh, an African-American president not once, but twice. And African-Americans are 13% of the population. So that happened with mostly white Americans. Um, so those are things to celebrate. So I don't think that um, being black and being patriotic are mutually exclusive. And I hope that that answers your question, Jacqueline. Jacqueline, you want to follow up at all or, do you, or is that good? I think that's good. I just was wondering, like, do you think like that ideology of patriotic, like, as you mentioned, like it's been covered in history, but do you feel that will accurately cover like the way you wanted your children to learn black history or do you feel it will not? Maybe re reframe that for me, because again, I'm, I'm not seeing where they're necessarily mutually exclusive. Okay, so with that, so like patriotic education per se. So what, like you said, you define that as like all the goods and bads of per se, like use for the flag, but do you feel that will accurately cover black history if it's patriotic? Because some view it as more like white history or like white supremacy and extreme stances. Do you feel that way? Or do you feel that will accurately cover black history? So like the evidence of slaves or other like Jim Crow segregation, et cetera. Do you feel that will cover that accurately or will portray it more like Disney eyes sense to put it for a politically incorrect phrase. Right. Um, no, I, I, teach, I teach my kids the good and the bad and the ugly. Um, I think that's what we all have to do, right? Um, and again, as Professor Johnson says, it's all, uh, the, the differences are not in our passion. I can meet someone who absolutely disagrees with everything that I believe, and I would not necessarily characterize that person as hateful or whatever it is, just because of their political beliefs. Um, that person is probably just as patriotic as I am. They love their country and they want to see this country succeed and this country take care of the members of this country. Um, I believe that uh, this country is the greatest country in the world. I think that a lot of people want to come to this country because of the economic prosperity that this country has, regardless of what administration is in office. Um, we're a beacon around the world. Um, I, I think when we look at this country and, and all of the difficulties that this country has had, it's still an amazing, amazing country. And we can still have this conversation I have the right to publicly disagree with you if I want to, Jacqueline, and not be censored for that and not face a caning or a beating or as a black woman, you're a white person to say I disagree with you and have any kind of uh, sanction for that. Um, so I, I think that you can absolutely teach uh, where we've come from, but don't stop at, you know, 16, 19 go forward to 2020. We've had a black president. We've got black members of Congress. We have a number of amazing, amazing accomplishments. Um, and we've gotten there through blood, sweat, and tears, but we've gotten there and we're not done yet. Um, but I think that, that we short sell ourselves um, to focus only on the areas. And maybe that's a good thing that we have come through so much that we are really focused on the things that still need to change. But I think we need to give recognition to the things that have changed and the things that are different and the things that are beautiful um, about this country and that we can have disagreements openly and have public debate and discourse that can be civil um, and that can change minds. I think, yeah, I, 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 oh, go ahead, Kurt. Yeah, I just wanted to add, I, I think I agree with a lot of what um, Marie has just said, but 
But it, it's interesting to hear the president call for patriotic education when in reality, I mean, I, I'm a lot older than most of the people here uh, tonight. So I don't know how you were educated, but my high school history books were, were full of what I think the president would love to see. I mean, it's, a, it's kind of a, a, a de facto celebration of whiteness that just ran through and through uh, the curriculum. Our educational system for many, many generations has been um, patriotic education. And I, I think this, this call for, um, you know, kind of a cleansing of, of a multicultural perspective on education and a call for a reversion back to those quote unquote good old days is, um, is not only counterproductive, but to me, it really does suggest that one of the reasons that I think I feel the president's supporters love him so much, and I'm not speaking for Marie, but I think a lot of white folks really kind of run to his side because of a certain anxiety and a certain fear that they're losing something they have always had and have always taken for granted, which is to kind of like to be the top dog, to be the, the top cultural dog uh, in our country. And I, I think somehow grappling with that fear is something that the next president, whoever he may be, really needs to deal with. If you want to think about uniting uh, a citizenry, uh, one of the reasons I think people are holding on to the, the militia movement, you know, this, this recent idea of, of, uh, of kidnapping the, the governor of Michigan and, and killing her, this whole idea, it seems to be fear-based, anxiety-based. You wonder why a thousand uh, people are killed by police uh, every single year. I, I've never seen a police force more skittish. Um, you know, the last thing I want to do, I've never been a police officer, so don't get me wrong. I don't know what it's like to be uh, in a situation like that. But I think the, the last thing most people want to want to do is, is go up to a police officer, you know, in a tension filled moment and say boo, because it seems like they'll shoot at anybody particularly if the target is brown. Why? I think there's just so much fear and anxiety that surrounds the idea that white folks are feel as though their power um, is diminished, their future uh, is not what it was in the past. I think somehow confronting that fear is something that the next administration has to do because um, you know, fear, anxiety breeds all types of maladaptive behaviors. And if we think things are bad now, uh, when people get more afraid, they feel more packed into a corner, I can imagine um, you know, the, the very worst scenarios that the president was hinting at when he didn't tell white supremacists to back down, those very worst scenarios could actually be more and more a part of the fabric of, of our everyday lives. Yeah, Marie, maybe I ask, you know, there's another question um, from Elliot um, Matos, Matos? which says our world is based on race to deny that it, to deny that is detrimental to the end of racism um i'd love actually both of you to comment on that in some way but um you know what what professor johnson was just alluding to is is an aspect of 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 the president the current president that may not be the kind of policies that you like right but is more the tone um and the willingness to tweet QAnon conspiracies and the willingness to tweet, to, to, to encourage a kind of belligerence and, and, and manly violence of sorts um, that for many people on all sides of the political spectrum is simply completely, not only unpresidential, but, but dangerous. And, and, and for many people, dangerous to black and brown people, especially. Is that not something you worry about at all, or do you not see it? Is that a fact? Am I, are, are, are Professor Johnson and I wrong in seeing this? I don't think you're wrong in seeing it. I think that you're wrong to see it exclusively on the right. I don't think let's that not perhaps- left, Let's not do left and right. Let's say this particular right. president who seems beyond left or right in many people's views. Okay. So I see that he has disclaimed white supremacy a number of times. He did not do it at the debate. And I think that a lot of the reason has to do with the fact that it was like, do it, do it right now, do it, say it right this minute, um, kind of in your face. 
Um, and you can disagree with me on that, and it's a free country, so you're welcome to do that. But that's you don't how think I it's because that's You don't think it's because but, that's a part of his base that he doesn't want no, to No, I don't. I don't think that. And I think that if you're talking about monuments and those sorts of things, um, he, I, I, I disagree that um, patriotic education is a cleansing. I think that what we're seeing now is that there are parts of our history, because we've agreed that history, that there are things that have happened in this country's history that are wrong. Everyone in this chat agrees with that. I don't think I'm, if I'm, if I'm speaking for someone who doesn't feel that way, I apologize to you. But um, the fact of the matter is that um, if we are removing monuments and removing, uh, you know, the names of universities and removing those kinds of things, what happens then? Because I believe you have to remember how bad things were so they don't happen again. What happens when we die out? We have to remember these things in perpetuity so they do not occur again. Do I like the Confederate, Confederate flag? Absolutely not. I don't think it should be flying anywhere. But do I think that it should be removed entirely? I think it should be in a, in a museum. I think we need to know what the Confederacy stood for. I don't think we should wipe it from every history book and never learn about it. Um, well, no one's that's a cleansing. That. That's a cleansing that I think is is problematic and scary for me. Is that if we don't talk about, you know, the hoses and the dogs and everything that happened in in our history, then we forget about them and those things cease to be scary. Uh, and because people don't know about them, we're already getting people who who don't even remember what happened during the Holocaust. I think that's what we're talking about. When we talk about patriotic education, we're talking about talking about the things that happened in history. We're talking about understanding history. And we're talking about revisionist history in some cases. We're talking about removing things we don't like because they make us uncomfortable. My premise and my thesis has always been Talk about the things that are uncomfortable. Don't remove them. Don't cleanse them. Don't hide them away. Talk about them. So, um, so Marie, if I could just interject, your point is that doing that really does revise education, but in a pro-social way. So you're redefining patriotic when you talk about patriotic education. It means having uncomfortable conversations about things that history books typically don't talk about. I think that's part of it, but I think also we're raising a generation, and forgive me for saying this because I know you guys are in college, but I really do believe that there is a movement afoot to rewrite history. And so when we talk about patri patriotic, patriotic education, we are in some senses being revisionist and removing things. Um, and, and there are people that don't even understand how the Constitution works, that, you know, what, what the Bill of Rights is, or, you know, just basic civics education. Um, and so I, I think that we need to understand what our Constitution is based on and where it came to be. And we may not like the people uh, that wrote the Constitution. We may not like the lifestyle choices that they made, but this document is held up for over 240 years. So, and again, that goes back to what I said about Lyndon Baines Johnson. It goes back to what I said about any president. There may be things that I don't like about them personally, but you know what? I'm not voting for a savior. I've got one. So that job's taken. Um, I'm not voting for someone to be my best friend. I'm not voting for somebody to go to Starbucks with. I'm voting for someone who will uphold the Constitution. And if we do not like the Constitution, there are ways to redress our grievances. We can vote people into office that we do like. We can uh, vote people in that will make constitutional amendments, but there are definitely ways to do that. And there are people that represent Congress that have brown skin. And so we can definitely do some things if we don't like the way that things are currently being done, but the way not to do it is just, oh, I'm gonna go and you know, do something completely different we have a redress of grievances. And if we don't like it, then change it. Sky, you had we a question. Oh, you want to ask your question, Sky? Actually, I think I have um, a new question that I'd also like to ask um, that I think is a little bit more relevant to Marie's point. So on the topic of if 
if we don't like something, we should just change it. I feel like I want to ask how, so judging from, I have a few examples, but how effective is changing systemic oppression from the inside? We have so many examples of well-meaning policy being undermined by the logistics of oppression, like that of, like, for example, like that, that of Brown versus Board of Education, where we see now that schools are more segregated today than they have been in the 70s. Or like even with well-meaning policy, like we saw recently in Florida, where they were during 2016, they gave, after the election, over a million felons were given the right to vote. The caveat then being, though, a sort of pull tax. They're given the right to vote after they have paid all of their debts um, following their incarceration to the state. Um, or even further, if we're, if, I don't know if we're on the same page, but if we believe in voter suppression, like we saw like in that of Georgia and a lot of Southern states were like hun hundreds of thousands, like upwards of 300,000 vote, like voting records of predominantly, I think the statistics are like 70% of that being like black folk um, are purged from the records you know, the, the very basic ways in which we as Americans are supposed to interact with our government, interact with our country, like through voting and education, are, are barred. And so I feel like, I don't know, that I feel like there needs to be a reckoning with those questions. How do we, how do we reckon with that? How do we just ask people to change within the system when the system doesn't allow for people to partake in it to make a large enough change or even it's hard to even know all the little logistical things that will happen when you think you've done something right um so yeah i grew up in public housing and my way out of that environment was through education this president has given millions and millions and millions of dollars to hbcus um, and as I mentioned, I would have liked to have seen Black Lives Matter do that with the 464 million in the aftermath of the George Floyd incident, that murder, straight up murder. Um, I would have liked to have seen some of that money go to scholarships for people to enter uh, and, like I said, become paralegals, judges, all of those sorts of things uh, to make those systemic changes, right? Um, with regard to voter suppression, um, I, I think it was Avi Horowitz who did um, a video, and it's on YouTube somewhere, um, where he went into predominantly black areas and he said, do you have ID? Oh, I need ID to cash a check. Of course I've got ID. Do you need ID? I need ID to go to the doctor. Well, of course I have ID. Um, and, and so I, I think that, um, and here's where we get to some of the disagreements that we have with each other, but I, I do believe that some of these things are um, filtered through the lens of our differences in um, politics. I have a, an ID card. I can get an ID card. Um, it's not difficult for me to do so. And I have seen a number of Republican governors even saying that if you want one, we'll get you one for free. So I don't necessarily see that as a deterrent for someone to be able to vote. And now with COVID and they have absentee ballots and people are not voting in person, you absolutely can do so. Um, I have seen- the They've been suppressed. Like I think there, there's voter ID, there's voter ID, but then there's also like close to the end of election, they do like what we saw um, in Georgia between states, the Stacey Abrams and um, I don't remember her opponent's name. Right. But and I've there were votes that they were just registration was just registrations were just cast off so that's not even a matter of like not having the right paperwork it's that without your knowing without your without being notified whatsoever you suddenly lost the right to vote if you hadn't checked if you hadn't been checking that you had been re-registered over and over and over again so th things like that i think also should be considered in that question and i and I, and that's part of what i see as some of the policy discussions that we're having, right, is that this president is against mail-in ballots because of the voter fraud. Um, I see it happening on the right. I see it happening on the left also. I've seen a number of races where there were more people registered in a county that actually lived there. Um, and I think we've seen military votes that are sitting in boxes that are being, that were not being counted. We've seen videos, viral videos of people taking boxes and boxes of ballots and just putting them in their car or they're being dumped somewhere. That is not exclusive to the right or to the left. 
that yeah. is something that, that we need to address as a political system where people are disenfranchised regardless of their political philosophy. I just need to, I mean, as, a, as the moderator and somewhat professor here, I just need to say that all the evidence I've seen does not show that mail-in ballots are, are, are more fraudulent than others. In fact, for many people there, for any experts in voting law, they're actually considered safer. Um, I, I just want students to know that their votes are gonna count. Uh, we have a problem at Bard where the local government uh, largely to try and disenfranchise the students has refused to provide a voting place on campus for many years, including this year at the pandemic. And now finally uh, a decision was made to do so and, and the Republican party is suing to prevent it from happening right now and we're involved in a lawsuit right now. There's no doubt that um, there's an effort to suppress votes. I mean, I, I don't think that's a legitimate factual dispute. We can argue whether it's a good thing or bad thing, but I think there's a difference between the North mail Carolina, for example, the North Carolina Supreme Court said there was an effort to suppress votes of minority neighborhoods. Um, I, I just do. You, I mean, are we do we disagree on the facts or on whether it's a good thing? We disagree on the facts as you presented them. I think there's a difference between mail-in ballots and uh, absentee ballots there are a number of people that are receiving numerous uh, mail-in ballots. Absentee ballots go through a different sort of regulation. And so we would disagree on that. But again, I know I'm the minority voice here in terms I, of my, my politics. But. I just want the students to know that they should vote and yeah, they should vote absolutely. absentee vote or mail-in vote or in person. And I don't want them to think their votes aren't gonna matter or aren't gonna be counted. So I just want the students on here to know that. Um, Kirk, do you want to add anything here before we go on to the next one? I'm, I'm fine. Moving on. I know time is getting short. Okay. Um, Ellen Peckman has a question. Ellen, do you want to come on and ask it? Or do you want me to read it? I'm just looking at it now. I want to find it. I want to... Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for this. Can you, you can hear me, I think. Yes. Hear my video. It's not showing my video, but that's all right. Um, so um, I, first of all, I want to um, thank both Kurt and Maria Vat a lot. Had not ah. bad timing. Sorry. Oh. All right. um, too much technology, right? Um, and I want to get back to Marie's really excellent framing of issues, in a way, and I. I framed my question in terms of my concern about the truth issues. Um, so those are those are areas that still concern me. I, I, I really feel that the early part of our conversation where we're just um, parsing the conceptual issues that we're all struggling with in different ways of thinking about them has been very, very helpful. And I look forward to more of this kind of dialogue. Um, I did register in the chat my deep concern about the blatant lying and um, especially at the lowest level. But I don't want to reduce this conversation to that because I want to instead defer my moment to Olivia and ask Olivia to pick up from where, uh, let's not get ourselves tangled in the lying issues. <laughs> instead, Olivia's posed a really good question after mine and let me defer to her. Okay, uh, thank you. Olivia, do you want to ask your question? It's a question about the, the, uh, the response to COVID-19. Olivia writes, uh, um, oh, go ahead. Um, I'm just curious about how, Marie, you take Trump's overall um, response to the pandemic and like including him calling it like the China virus, everything from there to, um, I guess his reaction and the Surgeon General's reaction to the disproportionate infection rates in Black and Hispanic communities um, and how they presented that to the media. With COVID-19, um, the first part of your question was him calling it the China virus. Um, I, 
I call it COVID-19, I call it the coronavirus, but the fact of the matter is, and, and most people agree that it was, it was a manufactured virus. Um, he did close the borders in January. You're disagreeing with me, Susan. Um, I, I, uh, that is what I understand. And so the fact of the matter, it is a global pandemic. Um, the, so there's that piece of it. Um, the border was closed uh, in January and experts are saying that that did save lives. Um, and the second part of your question was, remind me again. Um, I'm just wondering how you as a person of color. Oh, people of color, right. Well, just you specifically um, as a Trump supporter see how institutionalized racism plays a role in infectious disease. Um, evidence of that during the pandemic that's going on? I believe that I read the statistic that only 6% of cases are truly COVID alone. That oh. most of the other cases represent underlying conditions. And we all know that African American um, health disparities have uh, comorbidities. Uh, type 2 diabetes runs rampant, heart disease, hypertension, a lot of these other illnesses that make us susceptible to some of these other illnesses. Now, do I believe that, that health care does need to be reformed? Absolutely. Do I believe that single payer is the system to do it? No, I don't. Um, I do believe that competition makes things better. And so privatizing, as well as having an option for truly indigent people, um, having grown up in um, a public system. Um, I saw a lot of fraud. I saw a lot of rampant abuse. And so I do believe that there needs to be uh, some sort of change um, so that the, there is a safety net for people who truly absolutely need it. I do believe that there needs to be more childcare for women who are coming out of aid and, and, and welfare to get job training. I think they need high quality, affordable childcare and not just childcare that's between the hours of nine and five. I think they need to have shift childcare. I think they need to have it for uh, people who are working uh, non-traditional hours. And so I think there are a number of policy positions that would help people who are black and brown. So, but, but there are health disparities in our communities. And so we need to talk about some of these things. When we talk about black on black crime, I know a lot of people don't like to talk about it. And I don't think it's the answer when people say, oh, but there are people that, you know, look at all the white police officers that are killing people. Oh, well, look at all the black and black crime. Those are apples and oranges. I do not believe that, that, that argument. I think that that is a, a, a fallacy that, that, that people on my side of the aisle engage in that I think is, is absolutely wrong to do. However, the fact of the matter is there are issues in our community that we need to address. Um, we do need to talk about uh, some of the issues that are systemic in our community as it relates to health. Um, we do need to talk about some of the issues that are systemic that we can control in our communities. Um, there are policy positions that will change things. There are policy positions that can do things. If you look at Tim Scott's Justice Act, you look at the President's Criminal Reform First Steps Act, uh, those are things, uh, there is absolutely an issue with uh, community policing and wariness with communities of color. And those things uh, attempt to address that. Um, Tim Scott actually says that he went so far as to uh, offer a number of uh, super amendments uh, to get this legislation passed that would have addressed body cameras, that would have addressed no-knock warrants, that would have addressed a number of issues. But it seemed to him, and if you read it, if you look at his argument, and I mean it's 30 minutes long, it's called the Justice Act, Google it, it is a brilliant argument. It is pretty clear that it has to do with solely his politics, that he would have given anything to have bipartisan support to change some of the systemic issues with community policing. So I think that this conversation where we're taking away labels, or at least trying to see a meeting of the minds, um, it, it, it's enlightening when you try to do that and really see someone else's perspective. And I hope that that attempted to address your concern, Olivia. Mark, do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, you talked earlier about systematic racism and about the kind of uh, way that that 
is maybe the importance of that uh, in, in, in thinking about these questions today or, or, or not? These are two conservative black people who are, being, who are talking. What? I, I don't know. Kirk? Um, um, I can talk about racism. I mean, I talk about racism all the time. I teach African-American studies. Well, I mean, the question was about ra systematic racism in COVID-19. Oh. You know. Well, I, I do think um, what Maria is saying is true. I think there are some um, obvious uh, health disparities between the black and brown populations and white ones. Um, I'm going to mute this. Okay, go ahead. And um, the fact that, I mean, it's it well documented uh, differences in access to health care, uh, in how people are treated when they're in a doctor's office. Um, you know, black people tend not to get uh, top, top shelf uh, treatments. Uh, and it's true for also for women. Um, when they go into a doctor's office. Um, and this is really, it's really beyond, beyond question. Um, so I think that the issue that needs to, that we need to focus on is given the outcomes, the outcomes are clearly disparate. The question is what causes them? And I agree with uh, conservatives uh, in the point that if we took better care of ourselves, we'd have better outcomes. Um, that makes me wonder why we don't take better care of ourselves. And there are a whole bunch of social and psychological answers to that question. But even if we did take better care of ourselves, would the outcomes be equivalent? I can't imagine they would be because of these differences in how racism is really a part of healthcare systems and, and health provision systems. So I'm not about to say that our community wouldn't be better off if we all exercised every day and ate four to five vegetable servings. But I don't think that could possibly be the entire answer because there are people who exercise and eat vegetables and still get sick, sicker than, than white people do. So that's my short answer. I'm, I mean, I'm not willing to um, reject all of what people who advocate self-care um, uh, uh, think is important. But, you know, we say it's a kind of a necessary but insufficient way to get to full health. It's important, you know, it's necessary to look after yourself, but it's not sufficient uh, uh, to get to a point of real equity uh, unless we kind of do something with these barriers and obstacles that are much larger than the individual. So we're we're pretty much at the end of our of our session now. Um, maybe I'll just let Kirk. Do you want to? Do you want to? You know, you wrote this book. You're, you you clearly thought a lot about these these this issue. What what's the one thing you would want to um, tell people today, uh, thinking about the issue of race and the re revolution of race and civil rights movement today? that maybe um, you think your book would help them uh, see more clearly? Well, that's a tall order, Roger. Great question. I know. I don't, I know. Know. I don't really know how to answer it. Okay. Um, I, I, I think I would, um, I think it's important for people to think uh, critically about what they hear uh, on the news. Um, and coming from other people. At the same time, I think it's important to, uh, to listen uh, to uh, the other side, uh, whether that means you're listening to progressives or you're listening to conservatives. Uh, because I think that, um, that we, we really, I, I think that the last, you know, um, uh, I don't know how many years, five, six years, have really shown how when we get entrenched um, it's, it's very difficult to kind of move forward uh, as a country. I think forward progress is possible and it is certainly important, but I think the underlying condition for that to happen is, uh, is a mutual respect. There are a lot of things I heard from Tea Party sympathizers that didn't really check out, um, but I still respect people's willingness to say what's on their mind, to espouse what they believe, um, 
and to take unpopular positions. I think what Maria is doing tonight is really courageous uh, because there are plenty of people who have uh, these dissenting views but aren't uh, brave enough to articulate them. I mean, I live in Mississippi. It's a state that has a lot of good things going for it. But I know that I, I go to work, uh, uh, at least I did before we were all locked down, and, and all around me are, are white folks who uh, would never say a discouraging word about um, African Americans, but I know lingering in the deep recesses of their minds are all kinds of assumptions and all kinds of doubts about who we are and what we can do. So I, I think the genius of people like Marie is that um, they are willing to say what's on their mind. And I mean, she made the point earlier that unless we have honest conversation, we're not going anywhere. Um, and, and so my, my advice would be, regardless of how unpopular your position might be, regardless of how you might think you're gonna be stigmatized or ostracized for saying it, say it, see what happens. Um, and that really is the only way for us to move from where we are to where we might go. So I want to say that despite the clunkiness of my question, you gave a great answer to it. Um, uh, you know, I want to, first of all, I want to suggest that you all go and read Professor Johnson's book. Uh, this is a really brave book uh, and, and good book and thought provoking book and it will expand your own way of thinking about these issues, uh, African-American Tea Party supporters by Kirk A. Johnson. Um, I also want to really second what Kirk said and thank Marie for, for, for obviously speaking in what she knew would be a somewhat unsympathetic audience. And um, these are hard conversations uh, and um, you did an amazing job and I really appreciated what you had to say. Um, uh, I think you certainly, um, uh, you know, I hope you opened some eyes and uh, made people uh, interested to know more about um, opinions that they often only hear in the uh, cartoonish caricature negative version. Um, whether they agree or not. And I think you were very clear about that and I appreciate that. Um, so thank you. And then I wanna thank all the students and, and others who sat through it. I mean, I think there's a lot of places in the country where these kind of conversations could not be had with students today. And I appreciate you guys being here. Um, so with that, uh, Marie, thank you very much. Do you have a final word you wanna add? I do. I want to thank all of you for being here today. I know that, um, again, I am probably in the minority politically. I don't want to make that assumption, but I'm going to say that that's what I believe. And I appreciate uh, the kind attention that you've all given me. I also want to say that I don't speak for all Black people, and I don't speak for all conservatives. I don't speak for all Tea Partiers, and I don't speak for all Trump supporters. And that's my point. My point is we're individual human beings and I don't think that anyone would like to be lumped in um, in totality um, with any other group. I will also say that I've been called every name in the book under the sun. I've had a lot of people who claim uh, tolerant high ground call me some very horrible names um, and I try not to do that in return. Um, I, I do believe that um, you should have a conversation, a real, honest, heart-to-heart, -heart, take preconceptions aside conversation, because I enormously respect Kirk Johnson for what he's done. Um, he took a position that was foreign to him and um, different to him. He saw something that kind of stuck in his shoe and kind of noodled it a little bit and wanted to, to pull that thread and see where it went. And I encourage each of you to do that. I encourage you to read his book. There's also a new documentary out by Larry Elder called Uncle Tom that is amazing. That has, a, a, it will blow your mind. It was kind of like the Jonathan Kozel moment for me with Savage Inequalities. It will blow your mind. And if you think you don't have preconceived ideas, uh, watch the documentary. I believe it's free on, on Spotify or it's it, for rent on Spotify um, or iTunes. I'm sorry, iTunes. Um, so I just want to thank all of you. Um, I encourage you, if you'd like to, to, to ask me some questions, 
Uh, I'm on social media. You're, you're welcome to find me out and, and find out more about why I believe what I believe. Um, and just have an open mind, um, have a conversation, do yourself a favor and, and consider just broadening your own horizons to talk to someone very different from you because that's where I think the change will occur. I think the media would have us believe that we are far more polarized than we are as individuals. I think when you really talk heart to heart as Professor Johnson and I did, um, when you really find someone that you can connect with, you'll find that you are not so different, that there are things that you actually do agree on. And Professor Johnson and I do agree on a lot of things. Um, there are some very specific things that we do not agree on, but I tremendously respect his, his uh, perspectives. And, and I feel like not only was I interviewed for this book, but I gained a friend. So I thank you all for being here today. Thanks Marie. Thank you very much. And Roger, would it be okay if, if Marie uh, just repeated in the chat the Larry Elder uh, video? And I think I got Did I get it right? I just put it in. Uncle Tom by Larry Elder? Yes. Great. And it's at iTunes, and it's also at UncleTomShop.com. Marie, do you want to mention your website? Um, I don't write as much anymore because uh, I'm a little busy, but uh, it's AfricanAmericanConservatives.com. And you can write me there, too. Thank you all, and thank, uh, thanks, Marie, thanks, Kirk, and thank you all for being here. And thanks, Sky, for helping to put this together. Thank you, Sky. Um, we'll see you uh, soon. Our, thank you very much.